jumping so hard that I turned off the screen. Hello, everybody. How are we going? All right. Lots of kids. Good to see you back. Mia Lily, haven't seen you for a little while. Haven't seen you guys for a good while either. Hey, welcome back. All right. This morning, we're going to read the Bible together and talk a little bit about what it says. And what have we been talking about? Jesus has been going around telling everyone about the kingdom of God. And so let's read that verse together. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Excellent. All right. So we've been working our way through the Gospel of Mark and reading different things. What was the story last week? Who can remember? Who can remember? Dorothy can remember. Oh, gee, I tell you, I work so hard on these kids' times and you forget them straight away. What was it? Jesus was walking on the water. That's right. We talked about that last week. Yeah, that's what we talked about. And rem- I don't need that, buddy. And so we were floating some uh, paper clips on the water. Do you remember that? Okay, very good. Well, so this story is the next story along. Some people have come to ask Jesus some questions to check him out and to criticize him and to find out what he's about. Because Moses is, uh, Jesus has become big and famous And so the religious leaders want to know what he's all about, and they're looking for an opportunity to have a go at him. Do you have a go at people sometimes? We criticize, and sometimes we do, don't we? All right, so this one's a big one, some tricky words. Who'd like to read the big one for tricky words? Oh, Celeste. All right, we'll start with Celeste. I'll come back to you in a second. The Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. Okay, excellent reading. So defiled, defiled hands. It means not just that they were unclean, but that they were defiled means they were, they were, they were wrong. They had wrong hands. And the teachers of the law got upset about this. So Mark, because he knows we don't really understand some of these things, he explained some of these things to us. So who'd like to read one of the explanations? You're going to read? Put your hand up. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hand a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. Very good. So it wasn't just that they washed their hands, because everyone should wash their hands before they eat. But they used to wash it in a very special religious way. Okay? Let's keep on going. Someone else to read the next bit of the explanation? Who would like to read? All right, Dorothy. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. Okay. So the people had very fancy and tricky ways of washing their hands and doing it in a special religious kind of way. Sometimes we do things like that in church, don't we? Like I just shook those people's hands before in a special ceremony. And sometimes we eat bread and drink wine and juice in a special ceremonial way. That's part of our tradition, isn't it? But these people had traditions about washing their hands and their feet and cups and pitchers and all those things. And so they decided to use this to criticize some of Jesus' followers. Who's going to read for me now? So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples have live according to the traditions of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Okay, so so some of these religious leaders saw that Jesus' followers weren't washing their hands in the proper ceremonial way. And they decided to criticize Jesus. We're going to skip over a couple of verses that we'll come back to with the grown-ups later on because it's quite a long passage, this one. We'll skip ahead to Jesus telling them a story. So who would like to read? Now, you're going to trick me, aren't you? 
Dustin Samuel Braxton. Yes? Oh, good. Okay. He replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about at you, hypocrites as it was right. Is written. Written. Hypocrites. That's a tricky word. So someone else to read? You going to read? These people annoy me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their te- teachings are merely human rules. Human rules. Excellent reading. So he's he's quoting from an old prophet there, and then Jesus says some tricky, some tough words to them. Who's going to read this one? You again? No, someone else who hasn't had a go. Do you want to have a go? No? Okay. All right. We'll go back to Celeste then. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. All right. So he says to them, you guys are following some parts of what God says and some bits you've made up. And some bits that God says you've forgotten all about. And this is the bit we skip over. We'll come back. And so Jesus gets at the response to these. He says to the, he has a big teaching. He calls them all together and says some things to them. Who'd like to read? Right back here. Again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside. A person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Very good. Excellent. Okay. So some tricky verses here and a bit hard to explain to kids sometimes, but these people were washing their hands so that they looked clean. But Jesus says, what happens on the outside isn't so important. It's what's in your heart that matters. And Jesus will go on to say it's actually from the inside of people that all the bad stuff comes. Whatever you eat and whatever you do on the outside doesn't really make you dirty. It's what's inside you. I'm getting a bit hot. Excuse me, I'll take off my jacket. What? What's so funny? Have you done something silly up there, Ben? What are they laughing at? You don't know. (laughs) See, what people look like on the outside and what's going on in the inside can be two completely different things. Someone can look completely fine on the outside and actually look really, really good on the outside, but on the inside, in their heart, there's something wrong, isn't there? What? You got a hole in your shirt, Ben. No? Me! Where? Are you laughing at my socks? No. Oh. 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 This is my old, old, old shirt. Whoops. I shouldn't have worn this shirt to church, should I? Did you know I had this shirt on under my jacket? No. On the outside, I looked good, didn't I? On the outside, I looked fine. And so Jesus says it's the same with everybody. You can look good on the outside, but he really knows what's going on on the inside. And you know even what's even better than that? Even though my shirt is ripped and torn and falling apart, Jesus loves me anyway. Even all the nasty and naughty things that I've done in my life, Jesus loves me anyway. Even when I mess up and hurt people and do the wrong thing and say the wrong thing, Jesus loves me anyway. He doesn't want me to wear a torn shirt. and He doesn't want me to have a dirty heart. But he wants to make it all better. But even so, he loves me anyway. Okay? Does that make sense? So next time you go up to the men in the church who are wearing their jackets this morning, you have a look and see if they, what their shirt's like underneath. How about you, Roger? Turn up, show us your shirt, Roger. All right. Good man. Okay. But remember, it's not what's on the outside that matters. God looks at the heart. And he wants to know what's, on the, what's going on in, in your heart. Okay. We're going to sing our song, our, kid, our holiday song that we've been reading, singing over these last few weeks. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Even with my ripped shirt, Jesus loves me. Hey, that's good news, isn't it? 
and then we will sing, and then we'll go and go forwards and backwards. All right, so let's go. <clears throat> that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me, Jesus loves me, that he played forward, slid back, and a little left, to the right, and up, and down to the left, to the right, lean forward, lean backwards, to the left, to the right, stand up, sit down, to the left, to the right. Excellent. All right. Shall we sing it as a round, or have we had enough? All right. Half you kids go and stand over there and lead that half. And Robin, will you lead that half again? I needed that last week. Where were, where were you last week, Robin? Oh, I forgot all about you. You go with those kids and you kids stand up here and we'll sing for this half. Who's going to win this week? Is it this side going to win? Or is it that side? I think there's more of them. So we're going to have to sing louder over here. I'll have the microphone. That'll help. Do you want to start with, with God or the leaning forwards? Are oh, you going to start with lean forward? We'll sing I Am So Glad. Ready? I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Excellent, wonderful, good singing. That was me doing that, Robin. I'm cheating. I'm not going to help your side win. You've got more people. All right. So, kids, we're going to keep on singing. We don't have Sunday school this morning, so go back to your parents. What is it cheering for? But there's going to be, if you go up to... To Miss Ros up the back, Mrs. Ros is up the back. She's got a piece of paper for you, some activities to do. I'm going to go and change my shirt, otherwise no one will be able to concentrate on the message. Yes, that's all I'll say about that. It's my great privilege to be your pastor this morning and to get to know folks and the highs and the lows and all the things that happen with that. It's my great privilege to be involved with people. If you're visiting, uh, if you this morning haven't got a copy of our sermon notes, please put your hands up. Some of the young ladies are handing them out there so you can follow along with what we're talking about. Let's pray. Father God, as I stand to speak to these people this morning, I pray that you would quieten my heart and help me to hear your voice. Father God, this morning I want to say your words, not my words. In the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. We're working our way through the Gospel of Mark in the children. Read part of the scripture for us this morning. If you've got your Bibles there, you might like to turn to Mark chapter 7. We'll be working at 22 verses this morning, which really could be two or three messages. I will try not to go super long this morning. We're working our way through the Gospel of Mark and we've been talking about the fact that Jesus has been proclaiming the kingdom of God throughout the Gospel of Mark. So from Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus proclaims his message. And again and again, whenever Mark says Jesus taught them or Jesus spoke to them or Jesus preached to them, I believe he's teaching this message. Let's read it together. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news. The good news is that the kingdom of God is here and we should turn away from our sins. And We'll talk a little bit about those things particularly this morning. The last few weeks, we've been talking about Jesus feeding the 5,000. 
Then Paul came and spoke to us about uh, what that meant from the Old Testament uh, and the pictures there from the Old Testament, and then Jesus walking on the water. And we talked about the idea that in these stories, Jesus is demonstrating to the people that he is the prophet that Moses told them would come. In the Old Testament, Moses was the great leader who had led the people out of Egypt, out of slavery, and almost into the promised land. The different adventures, you can read about that in Exodus. But at the end of, Jesus, at the end of Moses' ministry, he said, there's another prophet coming, someone who will be like me from amongst yourselves, but who will be better than me, he said, because he will have the very words of God in his mouth. And so in chapter 6, we read again and again of Jesus demonstrating or replicating the miracles of Moses in a different way, in a better way, in a more amazing way, to demonstrate that he is the prophet that Moses told the people would come. And so in chapter 7, we have a response to this. The religious leaders, the followers of Moses, the people who've been studying the Old Testament scriptures their whole lives, hear about Jesus doing these amazing things, and they think, we better come and check him out. And they come down from Jerusalem. and They came down and they gathered around him and they saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. And this to them was an indicator that Jesus cannot possibly be greater than Moses. He can't be the prophet because his followers aren't following all our religious rules. They're not washing their hands in the right way. It's not that they had dirty hands while they were eating. They just hadn't washed them in the ceremonial way. And Mark, Mark and Matthew both tell this story. Mark is written to people like you and me who don't understand necessarily the intricacies of the Jewish faith. So Mark gives us an explanation, which we read in the kids' time. He says the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash, and they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and kettles. And so they would wash things in a certain ceremonial way and maybe say a prayer as they did it, and all these things because they would have been handled down to them from generation to generation. And so when the Pharisees and the teachers of the law see that Jesus' disciples aren't doing this, they say, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their hands, eating their food with defiled hands? Why don't they hold to the traditions of the elders? And again and again through these verses, we will hear that word tradition. 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 So much so that it reminded me of this scene from a very famous film, and hopefully it'll work. Who's seen Fiddler on the Roof? If you've not seen the movie or the musical Fiddler on the Roof, you can uh, watch it. Hopefully it'll come up. Maybe it needs to be clicked on. Maybe not. No? Just doesn't like me this morning. What a shame. All right. Well, in this movie, it's, it's a Jewish village in uh, part of a Jewish, a Jewish enclave in a Russian village uh, in the turn of the 20th century. And... Um, Heavy, the main character, says, look, life here is delicate. We need to keep things in balance. And how do we keep things in balance, he says? Tradition. And they start singing, tradition, tradition. And they go through all the different traditions. And the, the bit I wanted to show you is Tevi goes and he says, our tradition is that we always wear a hat. And we always have a prayer shawl to show that we belong to God and to show that God is God and we are not God and then he goes along and says, and do you want to know how this tradition started? He says, well, I'll tell you. I don't know. I don't know. This is just a tradition in this, in this village, and, and I encourage you, go and watch the video at home if you've not seen it before. Some of our new Australians may never have heard of this beautiful musical. It's great, worth the watch. And, of course, in the end, Tevi ends up breaking all the traditions so that his daughters can marry the men that they want to marry. Then, and tragically, at the end, they all end up as refugees. And uh, it's a disaster of that story, but it's a beautiful story. It may speak to some people here this morning. But these traditions that these Jewish people have been holding to for centuries in, in Russia is how they, they maintain who they are. That they're separate from these other people. They're different. 
How did their traditions begin? Heavy says, I don't know. And same with this tradition that we've been talking about here this morning, this tradition that the Jewish people would wash their hands in this certain way, in the ceremonial way. How did that become a tradition? We don't know. It's not written in the Old Testament that the people should wash their hands in this way. These are not commandments of God. These are commandments of men that have grown up around the Old Testament law. Beyond the commandments of God, they've then put in these extra steps. In Exodus chapter 30 and Exodus chapter 40, you've got the, the references there. It says that the high priest and the priest should wash themselves in a ceremonial way before they go into the temple. So maybe it grew out of that. If the priest does this before he goes into the temple, well, maybe ordinary people should do it too. And if ordinary people should do it sometimes, maybe we should do it all the time. And if we do it when we're out to eat, well, maybe we should do it when we come back from the marketplace as well and all these other things, you know? You might have bumped into a Gentile at the marketplace. You better wash your hands when you come in. And so tradition builds up and builds up around the commandment of God. So let's imagine that this edge of the stage is a cliff, a gigantic cliff. And let's imagine the word of God says, be careful of the edge of the cliff. Well, that's a good instruction. Be careful, don't fall off the cliff. Well, what the Jewish tradition and what all religions do is say, rather than just saying, be careful of the edge of the cliff, it'll say, keep, back from the, keep a meter back from the edge of the cliff. And in case that's not safe enough, we better build a wall as well. And in case that's not safe enough, we better paint the wall yellow. And eventually we think, well, we can't even go near that little yellow wall, so we better keep a meter back from the little yellow wall. And in fact, so that we don't touch the little yellow wall because that's sacred now, we better build a bigger wall, maybe three feet high, and paint it blue. And because over centuries that blue wall becomes sacred, well, you better keep a meter back from that, and so on and so on and so on. And so tradition builds on the word of God. The word of God just said, be careful not to fall off the cliff. Religion and tradition build up these extra barriers, extra barriers, extra barriers, until we're back here arguing about what color the fourth wall should be, instead of worrying about falling off the cliff. Tradition becomes this snare that destroys people. And Jesus knows this. So Jesus doesn't respond to their concern, their immediate concern with an immediate answer. He says, you guys have always been this way. And it's true. Religious people have always been religious. And every organization that starts off with you know, a couple of entrepreneurs and great ideas over time, it becomes more and more traditional, more and more religious this thing that used to be young and dynamic and exciting becomes bureaucratic. That's the nature of humans. We like to invent rules. And so he quotes from Isaiah the prophet and says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. We've spoken about that word before. Hypocrites is the, the Greek word for actor, an actor, someone who pretends, someone who puts on a different face, someone who wears a jacket over their torn shirt. Hypocrites. He quotes from the Old Testament. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus is quoting Isaiah from about 700 years earlier, who's talking about his own people at the time who have this form of, of religion, this form of godliness, but most of it's just made up stuff. They're not actually looking at what God has actually said teaching this human rules. And Isaiah writes that long before Jesus. Jesus says, you've let go of the commands of God. Instead, you're holding on to human traditions. That word again, tradition, tradition. Jesus says, that's not good. Get back to what the word of God really says, not what you think it says. Get back to what's actually written on the page, what you, not what you imagine is written on the page. And this is a word of warning to us as well. When our traditions, when our culture becomes more important than what God says, then we're in trouble. Tradition's not always a bad thing. Tradition helps hold families together and hold communities together. The language we speak, the way we dress, the different things, these are good things. But we can't pretend that our tradition is the same thing as what God has said. 
And that's a challenge to us as a, as a multicultural church, for us white people who've been, you know, this is, we've been here for, us middle Australians, we've been here for generations. We may think our way of doing church is the right way. And then we have our wonderful new Australians coming in with their culture and their language and their different way of doing faith. It's not that the white way is right and that the brown way is wrong or that the black way or the yellow way or whatever way it is. All of that is culture. We need to come back to the word of God. What does the word of God say? So in my, in my culture, it's traditional that we go home on a Sunday afternoon and have a roast lunch and then have lie down and have a sleep. Your, that's a good tradition. That's a good culture. There's nothing in the scripture about it. And if I get upset about it, that you don't do that in your culture or your tradition, the word of God doesn't say anything about it. Some people like to sit in the same seat every week. Put your hand up if you're sitting in the same seat this week as last week. Oh, tradition, tradition. Hey? And if you sit in the wrong seat, I wonder if someone will come and say to you, excuse me, that's my seat. Has that, has that ever happened to you in church before? In the Salvation Army, the officer always used to sit on the platform. They had a chair on the platform. The pastor would sit on the platform just so that no one would take their seat, basically. You're welcome to take my seat as long as you're happy to preach. <laughs> No, that's too dangerous. I take that back. <laughs> tradition, tradition. The fact that we're sitting in rows looking at the front, that's tradition. That grows out of our revivalist heritage from the 1860s, 1870s, when churches like the Wesley Methodist and the Salvation Army and our revivalist holiness churches started. We imitated the music hall. The music hall was we'd have someone on stage singing and dancing and people would sit in rows facing the front. And so when we started churches, we did it in the same way. It's not always been the way. Sitting in rows facing the front, that's not how, not in the scriptures, doesn't say we have to do that. That's tradition. And there are many, many other ways of talking about this. But Jesus points at one of their traditions and goes on. We didn't read this part in the kids' time because it's a bit complicated for little kids. It's even complicated for me. But Jesus says to them, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. He gives them an example. He quotes Moses. Moses said, honor your father and your mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. That's fair enough. That's in the Ten Commandments. Honor your father and your mother. But then he goes on and says, but you guys have made up this extra rule. You say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is, devoted to God. The korban is the Hebrew word there for a gift or an offering. Then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. See, the Jewish obligation was when mum and dad get old, the, the children should care for them and look after them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had said, instead of giving your mum and dad a bit of money to look after, what you can do is say, oh, actually, this money, I'm going to give it to God. Going to keep it aside for a sacred purpose. Mum and dad, you're just going to have to make do with what you've got. But of course, they would never actually give it to God. They'd wait for mum and dad to die and then say, Oh, what a shame, I'll take that money back. And Jesus looks at these guys and says, You guys have invented this really elaborate way of cheating your own parents. And then you pretend that it's religious, pretend that it's holy, pretend that it's good. And he says, thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. And you do many things like this. And Jesus gets annoyed at these religious people. In fact, the people that Jesus gets most annoyed with again and again and again in the Gospels are religious people. They're the ones who annoy him the most. So he takes this example and says, you've nullified the word of God. God says, look after your mother and father, honor them. But you religious leaders have made an excuse around it. You can get around it and get your money back when mum and dad are dead. And he says, that's just nonsense. That's not how God wants you to live. And so he begins criticizing them and pointing this out. This is their tradition. Tradition. It's taking the word of God of no effect. And so in response to all of this, Jesus calls all the people together. And he gives them a parable, a simple story called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. He's saying, pay attention. This is important. 
Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person that defiles them. Now, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but to a Jewish person, this is a massive deal. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. Jewish people in their religion have so many rules about what you can eat and what you can't eat, what you can touch and what you can't touch. If you touch a dead body to carry it to the grave, you'll be unclean for so many days. If you interact with your wife or husband, you'll be unclean for so many days. If you do this or they do that, there's so many rules. If you eat this and you shouldn't, there's so many rules about all this stuff. And Jesus comes along and says, actually, not quite. That's not how it works. That would have been really shocking to the religious leaders and the people listening to him. Particularly when we think about, for instance, the book of Daniel. Do you remember Daniel? Daniel has whole chunks in there about the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the guys who were thrown into the fiery furnace. Why were they fire, thrown into the fiery furnace? Basically because they wouldn't eat the meat that was given to them by the Babylonians. They didn't want to eat their non-kosher food. They said, we'll just eat vegetables. And they set themselves apart and all the rest of it. And they, set apart, and they, they, did, they became heroes for refusing to bow down to the way the culture around them lived. And the Jewish people held them up as great heroes. Jesus comes along and goes, actually, it's not so much about what you eat and don't eat. That's not the problem. This is a massive, and I could spend a few weeks just talking about this, the fact that Jesus seems to be contradicting Moses. We've talked about that a few weeks before, that Jesus has come along and feared the 5,000 and walked on the water and done the things to demonstrate that he is the new prophet, the prophet that Moses said would come along. And then in this one little verse... It's almost as if he's taken a red pen to almost most of what Moses has written in the Old Testament and crossed it out. Is that what he's doing? Is that the implication? How does that work? And we could have big discussions about what that means for Scripture and which bits of it can be trusted and which parts can't. Ultimately, it comes down to this, that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the one who has the very words of God in his mouth. So if we seem to have an argument between Moses and Jesus, let's listen to Jesus. If we seem to have an argument between Jesus and Paul or James or one of the other epistles in the New Testament, let's listen to Jesus. In reality, they don't disagree with each other. They're not arguing. They only seem to. But even when they seem to disagree, let's listen to Jesus. Let's put him at the center of our faith. We are Jesus followers, not Moses followers. We're Jesus followers, not Paul followers. We want to do what Jesus says. In reality, they're not disagreeing, but Jesus is pointing to the heart of the issue. Nothing outside a person can defile them. Rather, it's what comes out of a person. And the disciples are confused by this. They haven't quite grasped it. After he'd left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Isn't it clear? Isn't it obvious what I've said? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. Now, we know, of course, that certain things you eat can affect your heart, cholesterol and all the rest. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking as a scientist. He's talking as a, as a, as a leader of faith. He's saying this stuff that comes in, it doesn't pollute your soul doesn't, he says. There's nothing, no, nothing you can eat or whatever that defiles your soul. And we know we should wash our hands, particularly in this time of COVID and the dangers out there. We know there are bugs and things that can damage our bodies. But Jesus says that won't damage your soul. It won't damage your heart. It won't damage what's actually essential about you. Because guess what? Your heart, your soul, it's already damaged, Jesus said. He says, it's What comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it's from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. These things come out of the human heart. 
So what you eat or what you do on the outside, your religious activities, Jesus says you can do all those wonderful religious activities. It won't change what's going on inside. Jesus says everything, something is wrong with everyone. With every human, there's something wrong with us all. It's a problem of the heart. There's something wrong with everyone. Problem of the heart. Except for one person. There's one person who doesn't have that problem of the heart. You know who that is, Archer? Who is it? Jesus. Absolutely. We believe that Jesus was born in such a way, the virgin birth and and that sort of thing, the whole thing that he was born, that he didn't have this heart problem. He was born as humans were meant to be born. Perfect clear and pure. And God himself took off, God sent his son into the world. He took off all of his power and majesty. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And came and was born amongst us and walked among us to show us what God is really like and to show us what we should really be like. Before this disease came into this world, this disease called sin, and infected our first parents and Adam and Eve and down through the generations, it's infected us all. Something wrong with everyone except for Jesus. He is the only one who can set it right. So to finish off this morning, I turn to Romans. I'm not going to read you all of Romans 1, 2, and 3, but this is Paul's great letter, his great preaching, his great sermon about this very thing. Paul takes these words of Jesus and expands them and explains them to us, making it making the whole gospel clear for us. So from chapter 1, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of this good news about the kingdom of God because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, the righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. As a preacher, I want to add to Paul's words, but I don't have time this morning. Let's let Paul speak for himself. He says, This wrath of God is being revealed against heaven, against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over. He lists all the terrible things that these people have done, wickedness and evil and greed and depravity, full of envy and murder and strife and deceit and malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil and disobey their parents. Hang on a second. They disobey their parents? He's just listed all these terrible ways that people live and then he adds in and they disobey their parents. He's pointing back to Mark chapter 7 where Jesus is saying, you guys don't even follow the bit that says about honouring your God, about honouring your parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, that they not only continue to do these things but they also approve of those who practice them. And so chapter 1, Paul gives this long list of the wickedness of humanity that comes out of our hearts and all the things that are wrong with people. And then in chapter 2, and he says, by the way, you guys are no better. In case you're judging everybody outside and saying, yeah, Paul, they all stink. In chapter 2, he says, but you have no excuse either to pass judgment on someone else. For whatever point you judge another, you're condemning yourself Because you who pass judgment do the same things. 
We know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them, and yet do the same thing, do you think how you can escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience, not realizing that God's kindness intended to lead you to repentance? And he goes on through chapter 2 to talk about the fact that all of us, religious and non-religious, people who are Jews and Gentiles, people who've grown up in the church or people who've grown up in the most worldly situation, we're all affected by sin. It gets into all of us. We've all got this heart problem. And you can read that. I encourage you to read it. And his conclusion in chapter 3, he says, this is what the Old Testament says. There's no one righteous. Not even one. There's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've become together. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. In the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You listen to that and go, what hope have we got? What hope have we got? That's me. Paul is talking about me. I don't know about you. He's talking about me. And then comes the big but. Verse 21. But now. Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has become known. The righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between the religious and the non-religious, between those who've grown up in the church and those who haven't. There's no difference for all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. What Jesus said in Mark chapter 7 is that people have got a heart problem. They've got a blood problem. Your blood is no good. There's something wrong with you. It can't be fixed. You can't do anything about it. But Jesus says, but my blood's fine. My blood is good. My blood is pure. I will shed my blood for you. So that what is in your heart can be taken away and destroyed and removed. And you can become like I become. And so Paul, when he's preaching this sermon, and I believe he was, I wouldn't hate, I'd hate to be the guy who had to write down as Paul started talking. Would you? You have to quill and ink and a bit of papyrus, and Paul would get excited and start preaching in the prison cells. And the poor fellow's there on the other side of the window, scrabbling it down. He gets excited. He says, there's no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely. We're made right with God by the grace of God, by the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. The problem that Jesus points out to us in Mark chapter 7 is the problem that Jesus came to fix. The kingdom of God being demonstrated was demonstrating the fact that God loves us in spite of our torn shirts that we wear under our jackets, and in spite of the dark thoughts that we carry in our minds, and the hatred we hold in our hearts, and the traditions that we cling to. God loves us so much that he sent his son to die in our place that we could know peace with God. What does Jesus say to do? Repent and believe. Turn away from all these wickedness and all these sinful things and go to Jesus and say, Jesus, I need your help. I can't do this myself. Give me your blood. Give me your heart. Make me new. And Jesus says, yes, amen, I will. Are there any questions this morning before we conclude? Anything I've said this morning that's 
poking a little ding in your brain and you want to ask about it, now's the time. My phone number's there, my email is there. If you'd like to speak to me about any of these things, please do so. That's why I'm here. To talk to people about Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us. We talk a lot here about our faith fingers, the different ways in which we can grow in our faith. I guess I want to say this, so the, the different ways we grow in faith, our private time, our devotions, where it's just me and God alone with the scriptures and praying and singing or doing whatever, going out and standing on a hill or wherever you do that, however you do that, that private time, so important. Having that trusted friend, someone we can go deep with, someone who knows what's really going on with us. Importance of having that person. Importance of being part of a small group, a group of brothers and sisters who get together to read the word and hold each other accountable and go deep into the things of God through study and through accountability. The importance of mission, of pointing other people to Jesus, whether through knocking on their door and saying, I'd like to talk to you about Jesus, or doing good for others, or however you do that mission, however you point people to Jesus, so important, and coming to church. These are five ways we can grow in our faith, but they are not our faith. These things are not our faith. They're an expression of our faith. And the great danger of us, of all, of all faith movements, of Christianity in particular, is the danger of turning what's real and vibrant and turning it into tradition, of turning a relationship with God and turning it into religion, taking the be careful of the edge of the cliff and turning it into 57 rules on how to avoid falling off the cliff. The great danger of Christianity, of faith, is that we take what is real in our heart and we turn it into merely rituals. We need to keep going back to the real word of God. The real word of God is Jesus. Jesus is the living word of God. We need to have that relationship with him. These are ways in which we grow in our relationship with Jesus. You think about this. I have a relationship with my wife. I'll make an example of you this morning, Carl. She's very beautiful, my wife. Now, let's imagine that, um, that I had a, a trusted friend who I spent time talking about Talia with. So I went and spent time with, with Ben, and we have good chats about Talia each and every week. And then I have a small group that I go to with 10 or 12 of the men in the church, and we get together and we talk about my relationship with Talia. And then let's imagine I go on mission and I point people to say, look at Talia, she's fabulous, she's the best, she's wonderful, she's a great wife and a fabulous mother, and she's pretty darn good looking too. Imagine I point people to her. And then I gather together with a 100 of my friends and I sing songs about how wonderful Talia is. But I never talk to her. Never spend any time with her. Our relationship would not last very long. These things that I could do to celebrate my relationship with Talia aren't the relationship. And so the things that we do to grow our faith aren't the same as our faith. We need to be very clear and be careful that these things do not become traditions, do not become religion, but instead enhance our faith. The song I've chosen with this morning is a song that I love. I've known it since I was a little tiny boy. If on my soul a trace of sin remaineth, if on my hands a stain may yet be seen, if one dark thought a wearied mind retaineth, oh, wash me, Lord, till every part be clean. For I would live that men may see thyself in me. I would in faith ascend thy holy hill. With my thoughts in tune with thy divinity, would learn how best to do thy holy will. We do need a good wash, but we need a good wash from the inside out. And that's a good wash that only the Lord Jesus can bring. If you're here this morning and you've got some things that you need to hand over to God, as we sing this song this morning, confess them and bring them to him. If on my soul a trace of sin remaineth, 
If on my hands a stain, may it be seen. If one dark foot a weary mind retaineth, oh, wash me, Lord, till every part be clean. For I would live that men may see thyself in me. I would in faith ascend thy holy hill. And with my thoughts in tune with thy divinity, would learn how best to do thy holy will. Father God, this morning we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for who he is and what he has done for us. We thank you, Father God, that he is the perfect man without that heart condition that affects the rest of us. Father God, this morning, if there's anyone here who's trusting in tradition or religion to save them, speak to them just now by your Holy Spirit and bring them to a place of repentance and faith. Father God, if there's anyone here this morning who's trusting in their good works, the washing of their hands, their many prayers to save them, Father God, speak to them now. and Point out to them the folly of that action. Father God, we thank you that because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, we can know peace with you. We can know forgiveness. We can know a new heart and a new life. Father God, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Wash us from the inside out. Make us clean in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. I invite our worship group to come back to the platform. Sing our final song this morning, In Christ Alone, My Hope is Found. Talking about these wonderful things of Jesus and who he is and what he has done for us. If you have questions or would like to speak to me, please make a time. God bless you.